We come to our next speaker, who is the director of our glaucoma service at Will's Eye, and here is Jay Katz. Thanks, George. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks to Dr. Lee, the Glaucoma Foundation, the Harley Foundation for all the hard work they put into getting this event off the ground. Um, I'm going to talk to you about the three pressures of glaucoma. You've heard a lot about intraocular pressure. Uh, let's talk about the other two pressures which are less talked about. So let's start off with the eye pressure. Um, the eye pressure you've heard um, really is uh, the fundamental important thing that we look at in diagnosing and treating the disease. It's our immediate indicator of response to therapy. And it's based on information like this. This is one of the uh, uh, earlier studies showing that whether you're white or black, any ethnicity, the higher the pressure goes, the higher the chances that you're going to develop glaucoma. And we know that when the pressure goes up, there are characteristic changes that occur in the eye where there's loss of the nerve cells in, inside the optic nerve. And that leads to loss of vision and eventually blindness. So, this is a, a, a progression that we're trying to stop when we're treating glaucoma. This is a, a, one of the landmark studies showing that if you lower intraocular pressure in patients that are known to have glaucoma, you markedly reduce the risk of glaucoma progressing. So if you have an average pressure of 20, you have a high chance of progressing from glaucoma in this particular trial. On the other hand, if you went all the way down to an average pressure of 12, then you have an excellent chance of maintaining the vision over a period of many years. What's confusing to a lot of people is that when you look at the range of intraocular pressures, uh, we talk about the normal range of pressures based on normal populations ranging from 10 to 21, and that's a kind of a mathematical range. But there are people that clearly don't have glaucoma that have elevated eye pressure above 21. And there are also quite a few patients that have glaucoma that never appear to have a pressure above 21. So how do you reconcile that kind of uh, inconsistency? Let's look at normal tension glaucoma for just a moment. This is a, a picture of an optic nerve from a, a patient with normal pressure glaucoma. They've never had elevated pressure documented above 21. And uh, it turns out maybe one quarter of the patients in the United States are uh, really that particular diagnosis. In Japan, for whatever reason, it's over 90% of patients with glaucoma are normal pressure glaucoma. And looking at the optic nerve, in many of these patients, there is a chunk of the nerve tissue just missing, uh, and often happens very quickly. And it's often associated with a hemorrhage on the optic nerve. So some people say that's very similar to what you would think would happen with strokes, for example. Um, it, with the suddenness and the appearance of the blood there. Uh, so there's been a thought uh, going over a century now that, that somehow the circulation to the nerve is also very, very important. When you look at the circulation of the optic nerve, there, there's a whole set of blood vessels supplying it from different directions, keeping that tissue healthy and viable. And you can imagine that if you interrupted the blood flow in some fashion, that that may cause a lack of blood, ischemia, and even injury to that region that might be permanent. There are ways of assessing kind of the circulation around the nerve uh, that's referred to as the ocular perfusion pressure. Essentially, this means whatever the blood pressure is minus the eye pressure. And you can look at the upper blood pressure level, the systolic, or the bottom blood pressure, uh, the diastolic, or an average of the two to come up with this ocular perfusion pressure reading. And there have been studies uh, in the United States and Europe looking at the chance of developing glaucoma correlated with the ocular perfusion pressure, and in particular, the lower number, the diastolic perfusion pressure. And you can see whether it's Europe or the United States in these graphs, that once you get down to below 50 uh, perfusion pressure, 
the chance of developing glaucoma just skyrockets in both of these studies. This has been looked across the world now, and clearly there is a pattern here. Uh, no matter what ethnicity you are, whether you're Caribbean, whether you're African, whether you're European or Hispanic, there's definitely an increased risk the lower the blood pressure goes. So if your diastolic blood pressure in particular is very low, that's a worrisome finding when you look at these population studies. This is a particular patient of mine that uh, had progressive glaucoma despite very good intraocular pressures. And we're just trying to find out why that may be. And one of the things that we looked at was checking the blood pressure over 24 hours. And there are ways of doing that nowadays with automatic blood pressure cuffs. And her blood pressure in the middle of the night, which is not unusual, dipped down to a diastolic blood pressure approaching 40. So an extraordinarily low level that might possibly explain why she may be getting worse. So this is also confirmed by looking at some studies where, where they really felt that having a low diastolic blood pressure really led to progression of disease, especially in this normal tension glaucoma population. So not only is it critical uh, when you have a low diastolic blood pressure for perhaps getting glaucoma, it may also be very important for progressive glaucoma despite good pressure control of the eye. It's interesting, you know, people often ask about what can I do to help my glaucoma? And there's a lot of interest in foods and exercise. And this particular study um, that was done uh, in a large uh, population of nurses that went through a questionnaire, they thought that if there is a high intake of green leafy vegetables, there is a lower rate of developing glaucoma. And leafy vegetables have a very high concentration of nitrate. And nitrate is a precursor for nitric oxide, which you heard earlier in Dr. Dale's talk, uh, is one of the, part of one of the medications that we're using, and that happens to improve circulation. It may improve circulation in the eye. So certainly not proven, but that's an interesting kind of theory. So eating leafy vegetables may help because of the circulation improvement around the eye. Lastly, the, so you know, we, we talked about eye pressure. We talked a little bit about blood pressure perhaps being important. What about the pressure around the brain or the cerebrospinal fluid pressure? Um, this was a patient that had a diagnosis of normal tension glaucoma and had surgery, in fact, because she was getting progressively worse. And she went to a pressure that was thought to be excellent, and she wasn't clearly stable. And it turned out that later she had a runny nose, which turned out to be leaky cerebrospinal fluid because she had a crack in the skull, and that had to be surgically, surgically uh, corrected. So that, you know, has us thinking that, could that possibly have a role here in damaging the nerve? So on the flip side of that, so the, the cerebrospinal fluid circulation, just keep in mind, the optic nerve that goes to the eye is just an extension of the brain. So the fluid and the pressure bathing the brain is also bathing the optic nerve. <clears throat> so we talked about somebody that had a really low cerebrospinal fluid pressure because of a leak that perhaps may have an effect on the nerve. And on the flip side, what if you have a really high pressure in the cerebrospinal fluid level? If there's a high pressure, what can that do? Well, astronauts who have prolonged space travel were noted to have a drop in their vision. And it was unclear why their vision was blurring. And then they were examined, and it was noted that, as uh, shown in these pictures, that their optic nerves, which were normal before going to space travel, became swollen when they came back. And it was thought to be due because they had a higher cerebrospinal fluid pressure in zero gravity situation. Why is that? When gravity, when we're mostly vertical, our cerebrospinal fluid mostly settles down into our spine, but in zero gravity, it's distributed also up to the brain equally, and that seemed to cause a problem with swelling in the optic nerve when you had high cerebrospinal fluid pressure, which caused a drop in vision. So the thinking is that the, the, the gradient of pressure difference between the eye pressure and the cerebrospinal fluid pressure 
is met right at the junction of the optic nerve as it enters the eye, and that might be very important in determining the health of the optic nerve. So that translaminar pressure between the two different uh, pressure zones, the eye pressure and the cerebrospinal fluid pressure, may prove to be critical. Bill, can you advance that slide for me? Thanks. So is that, uh, is that going to be important in translation to looking at glaucoma? Um, Dr. Burdall, and I'll just remember that name for a second, he's an ophthalmologist that, that performed this study at the Mayo Clinic where they looked at people that had uh, their cerebrospinal fluid measured, not for glaucoma issues, but they happened to have a, a lumbar tap, a tapping a looking at the cerebrospinal fluid, and they correlated that with their eye diagnosis. And as you can see here in this graph, that the <clears throat> intracranial pressure, the cerebrospinal fluid pressure, was lower in glaucoma patients than in normals. And in specifically, normal tension glaucoma patients were even lower than high tension glaucoma patients. So maybe having a low intracranial pressure and having the eye pressure gradient be higher that way, relatively higher, is detrimental. And looking at those patients that have high eye pressure without glaucoma, ocular hypertension, they had higher cerebrospinal fluid pressure than the normals, and that actually may be protective because now that gradient is pushing more towards the eye, not allowing the eye pressure to go in the direction of the brain, and that may be protective. So again, this is showing a, a kind of a schematic in the normal eye here, you have the eye pressure and the intracranial pressure being kind of competing almost equally, so not hurting the nerve. In somebody who's out in space where they have an elevated intracranial pressure, you have a great big gradient shift pushing towards the eye, causing swelling. And in glaucoma, when you have a low intracranial pressure, there's more pressure going towards the brain and pushing on the nerve and causing damage to the optic nerve that way. If you look at the cerebrospinal fluid pressure as a function of age, it goes down as, as we get older. And the prevalence of glaucoma just keeps going up as well. And so are the, the question is, are they really directly connected? Are they causal here, or is it just associative? We'll find out maybe in the future. What's also interesting is that the heavier you are, the higher your intracranial pressure. So the thinner you are, the lower your intracranial pressure. And it turns out that if you're thinner, it appears that you have a higher chance of getting glaucoma. So this may be one reason that you may not want to be super thin with glaucoma, because it may increase your odds uh, of progressive damage or developing glaucoma. So I mentioned to you Dr. Burdall, who did that study in Mayo Clinic. He has this interesting idea now that he's trying to test out using goggles that can change the pressure around the eye. So if you're an astronaut in space, you put these goggles on, <coughs> and what you want to do is you want to increase the pressure around the eye to counterbalance the elevated intracranial pressure. So you prevent the swelling of the optic nerve in space. But he's also thinking about using this in glaucoma by having a negative vacuum, lowering the eye pressure with these goggles, lowering the pressure around the eye, which may uh, counter uh, balance the low intracranial pressure that patients may have. Interesting idea, still being tested. So in summary, I just talked to you about the three pressures. We talked about elevated eye pressure being a risk for glaucoma, perhaps low blood pressure, and low cerebrospinal fluid also being uh, risk factors for the development and progression of glaucoma. But I just want to underscore for you, the only way we know how to treat glaucoma is by lowering eye pressure, which hopefully overrides the other issues with low blood pressure and low cerebrospinal fluid pressure. Thank you.